Well, glad to have you anyway. I'll, I'll um, introduce you to the peop uh, viewers and then uh, 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 I'll start asking questions. Okay. 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 Great. But are there any viewers? Uh, there are some, and there are. There are. There will be uh, during the more, more. More will join. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. I see two of us on the, in this. In oh, this, in this uh, meeting, there are only two of us. Yeah, but we are using this. What uh, the book is about, and uh, what made you write it? Okay. Well, look. There's a lot of um, apparent controversy, mostly political, associated with climate change and the need to address it, and I found that um, many people turn their mind right off when they're told they have to do one thing or another, get rid of their car or, or eat less meat or something. And, and they don't want to, and that once they turn their mind off, they don't want to listen to the, to the science. And, and I have a number of friends of mine, one is a, a libertarian in particular, who said, I, I just want to know, I just want to know the background and, the, and, and I don't want to be told what to do. And I thought I might, it might be a way to reach more people who are skeptical or fearful of what might need to be done if they would just, so I just want to write a book about the physics of it. I, I don't talk about policy. I don't talk about what one might do in general, you know, or demand that it's just the science at the same time. I was writing this. It's important that I wrote that, you know, this is the English version, but um, the uh, during the pandemic, right after the pandemic began, I found myself literally with nothing to do. <laughs> I, all of my all of my, the events I might be doing, the travel I planned to do was all was obviously canceled. And I also felt like I needed to do something useful. There were all these people, first responders helping sick people and I was at home and I thought, well, maybe I, I maybe I could write a book on the physics of climate change uh, in, in particular for two reasons. This is a long answer to question, but I think it prefaces the, yeah. the book pretty well. Um, I, I would you I was the chairman of the board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists that uh, releases the doomsday clock. In fact, it released it like yesterday each year a new time. And when I became chairman of the board in the in in around 2006 i think uh we decided to include climate change as an existential threat among the possible threats which originally was just nuclear weapons but every year we ran a symposium where we'd bring experts on the different threats biological climate nuclear and so i'd had a, a decade of of tutorials if you wish by experts on climate change but i also thought it was important to write this as a scientist who isn't a climate scientist because if I couldn't describe the physics of climate change or understand it as a scientist, then how could any public person do it? So I think it was really important that I'm not a climate scientist and I, was, and I wrote this uh, because, because it emphasizes, and I wish I had the finished version to show up while I'm holding it, but anyway, it emphasizes that the science is simple. The underlying science is very basic. And I think that's the message I want to get across. This isn't some some new controversial science depending upon detailed computer models well of course in detail to figure out what's going to happen in different places around the world you need computer models but the fundamental science of climate change is basic physics that has been understood for 200 years and i thought i would write that and i thought that it would be fun to to write that and also investigate the history of it i like when i write books to talk about the history of how things were understood and so this is as far as i can Tell is, is, is fascinating science, but also simple science and interesting history. And I also, by the way, wrote it faster than any book I've ever written, which says something about distractions, because my normal books, Adam, which you held up, well, both Adam and, 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 and Fear of Physics probably took two years to write, at least. Um, but without anything to do, 18 hours a day, uh, um, I was able to write this in 10 weeks, which is just still shocks me i still don't know that's how I impressive it. It, well it was it was it was you know i was it, i was focused on just that and i guess i had a mission and it, it, and also it was it was compelling because the story began to tell itself the, the the other thing that i say at the beginning of the book and this answer to you one question may take all the time i'm sorry but but Go when i begin the book it's really important that i was also motivated by a trip that i had taken my foundation leads travel excursions around the world. 
and I led a group to the Mekong Delta in Cambodia and Vietnam, which is a perfect storm for climate change. It's a place where climate change is going to impact not a century from now, but decades from now, and it could affect tens of millions of people. And I think that really hit home because the people in Cambodia and Vietnam were so friendly. They've overcome so many disastrous political problems that killed so many people in the last 75 years. And yet they've come out of it so exuberant. And yet the biggest threat to them may not be something internal, maybe something that they really had nothing to do with, which is the sea level rise due to climate change. And I think as a, in some sense, I did this for them as well as anyone else. Yeah, you described the lowlands in, the, in that area and they are particularly uh, fragile. Yes, yeah, spe especially new results that show that most of South Vietnam is less than one meter above sea level. And one of the things I describe in my book is even if we, even if we stop burning fossil fuels or, or, or putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we've already put enough heat in the oceans to, to cause ocean, sea level rise, not because of melting of glaciers uh, alone, but remarkably something much more simple that every high school student should understand. When you heat water up, it expands and the oceans have absorbed a lot of water. In fact, in the last 25 years, the oceans have absorbed additional heat due to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of roughly something like, I think, 3.4 billion Hiroshima level atomic bombs, five bombs every second, every 24 hours a day for 25 years. That's a lot of heat. And because of that, we can say unambiguously, model independent, just basic physics, sea levels are gonna rise at least a quarter of a meter in the next 25 to 50 years. That's significant. It may not seem like a quarter of a meter is significant, but as I like to say, it depends on where you are. If I hold a bowling ball, a, a quarter of a meter right above your foot without your shoes on, it'll seem like a lot of, a lot. Yeah, yeah, and if you only have like one meter to go and then you, you know, yeah. rise yeah. it for like 25 centimeters, yeah. that's a lot of, you know. And, and you know, and, and they depend on, on, on rice. So the, the, it's amazing, the Mekong Delta, this, the Mekong River pushes against the sea, even at high tides. And if the sea were to come in, it would turn all those rice paddies into mangrove swamps and, and 64 million people depend on that rice. So it's, a, you know, it's, 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 it's regions like that where small changes can make a big difference. And, um, and we have to, and the point is that we have to understand that certain things are inevitable. And it doesn't mean we put our heads in the sand and say, we give up. As I say at the end of the book, as Louis Pasteur, the biologist once said, fortune favors the prepared mind. And we know, we need to know what's definitely gonna happen. We need to know what might happen. And we need to know even the possibilities for extreme events. So I try in the book to talk about what's definite, what we know, what we are sort of confident about and, and things that are more controversial and label each of them as they are. Right, so to talk about something totally non-controversial. So let's talk about the basics of uh, this greenhouse effect, which is a um, core concept in this book. So what is the greenhouse effect? Yeah, the greenhouse effect is actually a very bad name for, for something um, that a very well-known uh, French mathematician physicist uh, named it. Um, the point is that you know when you're in a greenhouse in the wintertime, it's warm. In Finland, you have greenhouses. Even in the wintertime, you can grow things. And there are two, there are three effects there. But, but basically, the sunlight comes in through the windows as light and heats and, and provides heat for the plants. And, and of course, as it heats up, that the, the room radiates in infrared radiation, but the infrared radiation can't get through the glass. So it stays in the greenhouse. And that, but that's not the real reason that greenhouses remain warm. It's also that the doors are closed and you can't have ex exchange of air by diffusion or convection. Um, uh, and that's very important. And some people say, well, look, the earth isn't like a greenhouse because it's wide open. And so in that sense, it's a, it's a, it's a bad name. But the one part of the greenhouse that really is, does relate to the earth, which is really quite basic physics, is that the atmosphere is transparent to visible radiation, which is the reason we can see the sun. And even on this snowy day where I live, you can, it's, it's light outside. But uh, and, and so the earth, the earth uh, is heats up by the sun, but of course it emits radiation too. And when equilibrium, the, and the energy coming in is equal to the energy going out. 
okay, and then the Earth remains at a constant temperature. Now, when it was first calculated, assuming that uh, before one considered the effect of, 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 of absorption of infrared light, the first calculation, which is a simple calculation anyone could do, given the energy coming in from the sun, assuming the Earth and the Earth radiates, a basic law of physics that systems radiate as the fourth power of temperature. It's a high school problem, or probably in Finland, an elementary school problem. No, it's uh, a high to, school problem. <laughs> <laughs> to, to calculate um, what would be the temperature, then you find out it would be something like 30 or 40 degrees below zero, which we know it isn't. And why isn't it that case? Because what's happening is that that some of that radiation that would radiate into space is trapped and it's causing and because the earth is radiating less efficiently than it would be otherwise it has to get hotter and hotter and hotter before it radiates enough energy to out to equal the radiation coming in it's that simple some of the energy is trapped so the earth heats up and heats up until it radiates out as much as it comes in and when you calculate that you find the mean temperature of the earth is like 15 degrees celsius yeah, it's a simple effect and it's if it weren't the case we wouldn't be here exactly and the physics is relatively straightforward everything about that we've known for what two at least a hundred years uh, at least 100, probably 150 years and the point is that what what trapped so the fact it was known that the earth must trap infrared radiation or radiation in order for the temperature of the earth to be 15 degrees 200 years ago what trapped the radiation was less certain and that took some time before it was understood what materials absorb infrared radiation and carbon dioxide is one water is another and there was a long sort of debate largely um largely due to some lack of understanding of the science of carbon dioxide uh due to a very well-known swedish chemist um Arrhenius. angstrom who's the son of the famous angstrom um oh, and, yeah, angstrom. and uh, yeah, and uh, in any case, so there were debates, and it's an interesting history as I talk about. But it was known that um, first that carbon dioxide and that it could produce a greenhouse effect. And in fact, as late as the mid, well, the late 1800s, one of my favorite calculations was done by a geophysicist in, in, in Sweden as well. Because some people say, may say, well, look, how carbon dioxide is is something like 400 parts per million of the atmosphere how can something that's so small do such a big thing and um and uh uh it was we, you know it was estimated in the 1880s that carbon dioxide could even at the level it then was which was more like 300 parts per million could in fact have the effect it had and and then people say well how can humans change things and this this guy did a wonderful estimate. He said, well, let's take all the carbon in the atmosphere. At the time, it was about 600 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere in 1900 or so. And, and let's liquefy it or, or you know, or, uh, liquefy it basically, like, like we, it is in oil, but just liquefy the carbon. Or, and then how big a layer on the earth would that be? And it would, it would be a few millimeters. And he said, well, look, life is clearly occupying most of the planet down to a depth of a more than a few millimeters so life can change living things can change the carbon balance in the earth and they certainly did even before humans living things changed the carbon balance in the earth and 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 such but what we're doing of course is taking a layer that's much more than a millimeter we're digging down and finding the carbon stored for millions and millions of years due to the death of other animals and uh, and, and pumping that in the atmosphere and and when you think of the numbers, you realize how significant the human impact is. There were 600 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere when that guy did that estimate. Every year, every year we pump 10 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere, 10 billion tons. It's meant that now the carbon in the atmosphere is closer to 850 or so billion tons. And the point is it doesn't all stay there. Some of it goes into the ocean, some of it is absorbed by systems, about half of it stays in the atmosphere. But the thing about uh, carbon dioxide, I say it's like Las Vegas. What happens in the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, the abundance of carbon dioxide that's there, that we pumped up now, even if we stop today, will not change for more or less 
will, will change very slowly for the next 600 years. So whatever we put up there that doesn't get absorbed by the oceans and the earth, which is about 5 billion tons of carbon every year, every single year stays there. And that's the urgency. I know I'm probably anticipating a bunch of your questions, but what the heck. Yeah, go ahead. People say, why should we act now? You know, these effects aren't going to become important for 50 or 100 years. Why do we have to act now? Why do I have to use less gasoline now in my car? The atmosphere, the argument is that the urgency is simply that because it's cumulative, every year we add more to the year before, every year we don't do anything, it becomes harder the next year to keep the total carbon dioxide level down below what, you know, what we'd like it to be before the earth heats up too much. So if we'd started conservation activities 50 years ago, when, and, 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 and by the way, this, the carb, this climate change impact has already been known and discussed for more than 50 years in science. If we'd started it, it would have been much easier. If we'd started in 2000, in, in 2000, you know, and, and 10, we would have effectively, if we if we leveled out the carbon production, if we'd been carbon neutral in 2010 or come close to it, we would have, in order to get there, we would have only had to reduce um, carbon production by 3% per year. But now, you know, we in order to really get to where, let's say, a two degree Celsius change, which we're very close to already, we're talking about 10, 10% changes per year, which is dramatic to the economy. And it'll get worse so that every year we wait, the, the economic and technological challenge becomes greater. But the but ultimately, let me point out, I don't want to seem doom and gloom. The real challenge isn't technological. I think the real challenge is political. Uh, and, 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 and this is the first time, essentially the first time humanity has to act as a whole. Because one country can't solve the problem. The United States can't solve the problem if it reduces its carbon unless China does. China can't solve the problem if, if Europe and the, and so we have to act globally. And I, and, and I must say, I'm not optimistic about our, our history of acting globally. It's time to, to potentially change the way we think about this problem and, and cooperate. Again, it's not, it, the world is not going to end due to climate change alone in the next 50 years. Like some people, some extremists may say that. That's not going to happen. And that's not useful to suggest that. There are going to be challenges and there are going to be places that are much worse. There are going to be some places that might be somewhat, somewhat better. But we can address, we can address the problems, but only when we recognize honestly what the problems are. And that's the, that's the point of this, recognizing what the challenges are and what the physics is is a long way for us to think about how to effectively address problems. Look, if Vietnam is below sea level, it doesn't mean Vietnam is ruined. Look at Holland. Holland is below sea level, but it's a very nice place to visit. Yeah, that, the funny thing, like to go back to the physics part of this, like you talk about how much uh, carbon dioxide we pump to the atmosphere, and then we yeah. have these geologic, ge geological cycles that take away the carbon from the atmosphere, but they are so much slower. And yeah, the, 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 even in my book, Adam, you may remember a few. I remember. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, before life, carbon cycles through the atmosphere by the, you know, carbon dioxide gets absorbed in the oceans, forming carbonic acid, which then eats away materials and forms calcium carbonate, and which then falls to the ocean floor. And due to plate tectonics, it gets subducted underneath you know, the, 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 the crust until, of course, it gets hot enough that it, the carbon dioxide is released and eventually released in volcanoes. And that cycle is 100 million years and it's about 0 0.04 billion tons per year due to, due to 0 0.04 right. billion tons per year is, is cycled through the earth. And before life, that was the only carbon cycle. Then, of course, life caused a carbon cycle so that the carbon in the atmosphere, you know, even without burning fossil fuels just to living systems um that cycles in less than 50 or 100 years okay but now not so so that geological cycle is there but it's trivial as you just point out it's 0 0.04 gigatons whereas we're producing 10 gigatons exactly. so you know that's 400 you know 200 what is it 250 times as much yeah uh, from, and then there's this cycle that life creates also that but that's also 
too slow. So what, what well, we it's need- slow, but it, it does, and it, it's 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 yeah, it's much slower. Life life, it it is true that life that that, and in fact, it was first viewed. One of the things I enjoyed talking about was how we discover, you know, how how uh, the the this uh, this very important curve that was that, that was uh, um, uh, first discovered by Keeling when he first discovered that the carbon was increasing. You can see that that it oscillates every year, and that's due to the effect of life. In the northern hemisphere, trees take in carbon dioxide during the summer and and basically respire uh, it out in the winter. And you can see that you can see the Earth breathing if you look at the pictures. You know, and and uh, you know, I have a picture. You probably have one. You can show yeah, same I've... picture. And, uh, uh, well, here's the picture of the Mauna Loa. Loa. Um... Yeah, that's right. And you see those little. That's Mon- he started that the Mauna Loa, you know, it's probably one of the most important ongoing experiments in the history of science for gone gone, gone for over 70 years now. Um, yeah, that, that was, those cycles, that's in my book too, those cycles that he first saw, he didn't understand, but then, but then they understood it as the earth literally breathing. So you can see the impact of life in the short term and the intake and exhaling of, of all the life, mostly in the Northern hemisphere, because that's where most of the forests are. Yeah. So we need to wrap wrap up soon. So um, I was thinking about um, wrapping up with the um, like, like you told in your book. We you've been talking about it a lot here. That uh, for some people it's really hard to somehow take in that the how how simple this is. It's kind of like the discussion is is so, on, on this very high level like talk about uh, these complicated models and details of these models and uh, still like the basis of these basics are really s- simple any any high school student with a little grit can understand it simple and well tested it's not as if they're controversial they've been tested right. they're the basis of modern physics if you if you if you don't buy it then you shouldn't you know they're, they're the basis of how ovens work and cars work and and so it's this, it's the same science but but at the you know at the fine details of what's going to happen in Finland and what's going to happen here that requires complex computer models and there's still a lot we have learned and it's a, it's worth pointing out there are things we don't know and it's okay saying we don't know doesn't mean we know nothing yeah, we know exactly. a lot but these computer models will not challenge what we know from the basic physics or will they well they won't they they'll change you know they may change specific predictions about time and scales and that sort of thing and where things are affected and how badly they're affected in the near term versus the far term. But they're not going to change the underlying physics. And they also lead to uncertainties that should not, those uncertainties should not make us feel safer. They should make us worry more in a sense. For example, we don't know. I was just in Greenland twice in the last year because I wanted to walk on the ice sheets and I watched them melting. The Greenland ice sheets, if they melt, they'll change sea levels by 21 meters, 20. I mean, by seven meters, sorry, 21 feet, seven yeah, meters. Yeah. That's enough to really affect where you are right now. And, yeah. and and we don't know, and we do know that over, we also know over the history of the earth that those that, that Greenland has completely melted. The ice sheets have melted over time. And sea levels have gone up and down over the last five million years by 120 meters, not centimeters or millimeters, but 120 meters. So these things happen. and. One question we have, we don't know when the tipping point is. Now, even if we've gone past the tipping point in Greenland, it's going to take centuries, if not a millennia, for that to melt. But it, it will impact on things, and we can, of course, have time to do things about it. But but those uncertainties should make us, if anything, as I, I, I describe um, uh, one of my a movie in the United States called Dirty Harry. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's this Clint Eastwood yeah. movie. And he points his gun at this punk and at this criminal and he says are you feeling lucky punk i don't know if there are any bullets left well the question is are we feeling lucky enough to ignore that possibility or 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 do we do something sensible and it's up to people i'm not telling people what to do but they should know what the issues are before they make decisions because informed decisions are much better than uninformed decisions definitely and you don't want to err in the wrong direction like you you know well, you know, the, the, you err in the wrong directions, you suffer for it. Now, once again, I don't want to point out, it's not it's not that all life on Earth is going to be ended because of climate change in the next century. It will, however, cause problems. And I worry much more about the socio-political problems. You know, 
when 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 there are millions of climate refugees who lose their you know place of living and and then you know then they they put pressures on the cities and that causes geopolitical problems and we've seen it in Sudan and 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 so uh you know I'm more worried about the sort of indirect effects of climate change if you wish in the in the middle term but you know I I one of my I I came up with a sentence which I kind of like near the end of the book I say the future is racing towards us like a freight train but it's doing so on tracks that we've built so we can we, we you know we're not helpless and I don't want to give people the idea we are and and we and this isn't a you know I I, I don't want to be it, it's challenging but it's it should energize people and not cause them to say, ah, oh, forget about it. You know, exactly. You Thank you. This it. is a very good thought to end it. And uh, please, I, I, everybody, read this wonderful book to be informed in this one of the most important discussions of our time. And thank you, Lawrence, for being with us tonight. Well, I appreciate it. It's been a great to have my books published by you. I, I would love to be there personally. Maybe I can come there soon. I think maybe. I'm going to be in Sweden maybe when a new book comes out. I love I love Finland. I've been there five times. I hope to. You're I always to welcome. Back. Thank we, you. And I hope to publish we'll... my next book. Great. Thank Let's you see. so much. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Tuukka Perhoniemi. I work at at the Astronomical Association Tuuk, uh, Ursa. And uh, with me, I have here Suvi Viranta, a paleobiologist from the University of Helsinki. And on the screen, we have Dr. Arik Kirschenbaum from the University of Cambridge. And he has written a book on, with the title, Zoologist Guide to the Galaxy. So we'll continue with the environmental theme. Or what do you think, Suvi? Yeah, my first comment would be that we had um, just a discussion, nice discussion on Krause's book on uh, physics of um, climatic change, which is of course huge catastrophe we are causing here. Okay. You can't Can hear. I not hear you. You are not hearing us. Okay, now, great. Got you now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Suvi will give us the bridge from the climate change discussion <laughs> okay. to the space aliens. True. Yeah, so I think your book is the first one that really explains why we, how we ended up in this catastrophe in, in, among other um, ca uh, ca uh, earthly catastrophes that we have, environmental catastrophes that we are in the middle. So, so it's explained by the natural selection that is be a result of like humankind is result of can you but that's maybe something that we wanna talk at the end of the and that's all. We'll continue with the Do you agree that that's true? It's because of the natural selection. No, but it, it's certainly something that, that is an important question because when you think about um life, when you think about what makes life the way it is um, there are trends, there are evolutionary trends. You see the same thing happening again and again. You see animals evolving in a similar way again and again, and it's not determined. It doesn't have to be that way, but it does happen. Um, and, and then the question is, you know, is it necessarily the case that, that a technological civilization like ourselves will always end up in, in, in the kind of trouble that we're in? But as you say, perhaps that's a, that's, that's something to wind up with. Okay, so uh, with the changing environmental conditions, we'll continue. But let's start from the basic idea of your book, Zoologist Guide to the Galaxy. And like the, the most basic argument that you have is that the theory of evolution or natural selection actually is something very universal. It's not tied just to our planet. And that's the, like the way how we can really imagine or not just imagine, but think why, uh, or what kind of living organisms, complex ones even, we can have on other planets or other places in space. Uh, isn't that the basic argument or is there something more to it even? Well, that is, that is a very important argument. That is the basic argument because at the moment we have no observational evidence of life outside of Earth. We, we, we don't have anything we can say about the detailed nature 
of life on other planets. We've never found any. But just like we can say things about the way other planets are made and, and their physical characteristics by using laws of physics that we've understood on Earth, so we can use laws of biology that we've understood on Earth and apply those to, to other planets. And the most fundamental of those, the most important, of course, is evolution by natural selection, which is the only way that life can come into existence and become more complex and, and, and so on. So we understand quite a lot about evolution. Even if we've never seen an alien, we still know quite a lot about how they will evolve. We won't know necessarily what color they are, what their biochemistry is, do they use DNA or something else. We won't know those things, but we can still uh, make a lot, a lot of conclusions based on, on evolutionary theory. theory. This strikes me as a very simple idea, and I'm thinking that, okay, is it you that came up with the idea? Like, how come, how come there's this very often thought, very common thought that, uh, okay, if there are uh, aliens somewhere there, we cannot possibly know what they're like, because they're alien. <laughs> but still, uh, the way you put it in your book, it seems so obvious that, of course, it's the same laws of biology that work on other planets, too. Like, how could it be otherwise? So, how did you come up with the idea? Well, of course, the, the, the science of um, theorizing about the nature of alien life is a very young science. It's only been 25 years or so that we've known that there are other planets in the galaxy. Uh, so th there hasn't been a great deal of time and people have focused more on a very, very big and important question, which is how did life evolve? How did life begin? How did it start? And until we know that, we'll never know the details of alien biology until we know the biochemistry. We can't know the details. So so it's it's taken some time to gather momentum. But now that we are so sure that there are so many planets in this galaxy, tens of billions of Earth-like planets in the galaxy, and we're pretty confident we're going to find life on one of them at some point relatively soon, now is the time to start thinking about more than just biochemistry. We need to start thinking about ecology. We need to think about the relationships between these organisms. How did... Um, how many different kinds of organisms are there? How do they relate to each other? Life only becomes complex when there are complex challenges. So it's all kinds of things like um, what are the interactions between different species, the interactions between species and the environment, who's trying to eat whom, where do you get your energy from? Those interactive ecological interactions are really the ones that no one's thought about because we haven't got there yet. We haven't, we haven't got there, but it is a field that we need to start addressing because the moment we discover life on other planets, we will have to ask ourselves, what's it doing there? Right? How is it? How is it interacting with other life forms on that planet? What, is, what does that ecosystem look like? And those questions can only be answered using using evolutionary theory. Is there any like serious counter arguments even for this? way of seeing or approaching the alien question? I think, I think the, the, the strongest counter argument uh, is that, in fact, life will be very rare in the universe. So there are still people who, who, who think that the origin of life on Earth was an extremely unlikely event. And even if there are tens of billions of, of planets like Earth in our galaxy, the chances of any of those actually giving rise to life is, is small. And that's that's an argument that, that can't be dismissed immediately. Um, I think it is an incorrect argument for, for, for a number of reasons, but, but that's really the, 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 the only, um, yeah, that's the serious opposition. But do you think that will go against the idea of, of the natural selection being something really universal? Yeah, there is no, there, there, there is no competing explanation for how complex life can can arise. There is simply no other explanation. Chance doesn't do it. Uh, life cannot arise merely by chance. Uh, um, and, and we know that natural selection is not just a universal principle, it's also an inevitable principle. 
once the prerequisites for natural selection are in place, simple things like like um, generational inheritance and, and variability and, and things like that, it will happen. It's, it's just a mathematical rule. It will happen to life. It will happen to computer programs. It will happen to political ideologies. Anything that has these properties will show this behavior because it is a very simple mathematical uh, concept. So I don't think there's any I don't think there's any doubt about about the, the role that evolution will play. Yeah. So so you end up um, um, arguing that we the the. the if, if there is another complex ecosystem, it will be very similar to ours. It's based on autotrophs, and there will be herbivores, and there will be predators, right? Is there any other way of seeing this, this chain? Well, I think there's, so th there are a couple of ways of looking at that. I, I think similar, it's not going to look similar. I think, it, it's, it's, I think we, we can be modest and say that, that life on other planets will probably look very different. But the roles that different organisms play in our ecosystem are fairly fundamental, um, are fairly fundamental strategies within that context of, of evolutionary theory. So life cannot exist without energy. Life cannot exist without energy. We're sure about that. Um, where do you get your energy? You can get it for free, like plants do. But the moment you start taking energy for free, someone else is going to try and exploit you. It's just an evolutionary fact. If there's, uh, if you can do better by taking advantage of someone else, then then that gives you an advantage. So this idea of different roles, different strategies in life, prey, predators. Uh, organisms that get their energy from the sun, if they're on the surface of a planet, organisms that get their energy by eating other organisms. Those roles will exist. They may look very different. <laughs> the organisms may look very different, but those roles will exist. Um, and, and, and by the way, the next step, which I think is a really important one, is the moment you have this kind of competition, you get movement. You get organisms trying to run away from other or chasing other ones or or going somewhere where there's where there's more energy. So so something like animals as in these organisms that move around that's that's pretty inevitable given enough time that's pretty inevitable could it be unicellular do you have to have like organism based on many cells or can you just have a unicellular ecosystem so, complex yeah, what we saw on earth when we look back at the history of life on earth is that is that life really only became complex once it became multicellular so although single celled organisms are very complex metabolically, uh, the roles that they play in the environment, the interactions between them are relatively straightforward, relatively simple. And it was only really when you got multicellular organisms so they could have different body parts, you know, eyes and legs and things like that, uh, that, that we saw an explosion in the in the diversity of roles uh, in the ecosystem. It's tempting to say we should expect that on other planets. You can't rule out another solution to to this uh, to this question of, of, of what can support complexity. But a really important thing we need to remember when thinking about alien life is that, yes, anything is possible. Almost anything. There could be really weird planets out there with really weird things on them, but they're going to be rare. The obvious stuff is going to be common. So. Even though you may find a planet with complex unicellular organisms, now the majority of planets are going to have the, the, the obvious solutions. Well, you two probably know much better than me that how can we tell the difference between some properties of organisms, like properties that are based on genes and th that way come from natural selection, or something that's our habits or learned, or, or is it a difficulty? Like, on our planet, we only know like a small part of all the organisms, and there's hundreds of millions of, of species that probably exist there, but we don't know almost anything about them. Uh, so our experiences are very limited still. Can, how can we tell if what's, what is contingent and what is inevitable? Hmm. Well, uh, you say our experience is very limited. Well, our knowledge of the of the modern world is is pretty deep. I mean, true, there are species we we haven't discovered, but we've discovered enough to to 
paint a really good map of the niches that are available. So even if there are some beetles that we've not discovered in, in the jungle, that's okay. We, we, we know roughly that there are beetle niches of, of, of various sorts. Um, so I think our knowledge of the modern world is actually quite good. Um, our knowledge, of course, of extinct life is, is much more limited. But again, it, it, it's this question of, of the common solutions and the rare solutions. So you look back at the fossil record, you know, and you see billions of, 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 of uh, marine invertebrates and, and in the different kinds, you know, you have um, cephalopods floating in the, in the ocean and you have, and you have um, uh, mollusks on the, on the seabed. And, and those are the common ones. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of species we haven't discovered that do strange things, but the common ones are there. And they are pointing at a, a, an assemblage of niches that just that seems to be the stable way that, that, that organisms interact. Some moving, some not moving, some feeding on dead organic material, some feeding on live organic material. You know, that, that, that map of, of, of niches seems pretty complete. Yeah, you talk about convergent evolution, which is obvious. I mean, same forms kind of evolving all, all over again. Um, also, I mean, we, I guess we have to ask a question about your real field, about vocalization in, in animals. <laughs> um, yeah, can, can we speculate a little bit if we have, if imagine a planet, like a, a solid planet, uh, Earth size or something, what are the different, for example, in your book, there's uh, physical characters of, of organism. There's there's communication. There's movement. There's uh, yeah. intelligence. Uh, if we come to the communication part, like so we so we just said, uh, what are the options? Like how would you yeah. approach approach this speculative yeah, planet? I'm and the reason that we see this convergence, the reason that we see the same solutions being evolving over and over and over again is largely because the physical world is limited. Not everything is possible. Not everything is possible. There are laws of physics, right? There's laws of chemistry. You, get, you can't get away from them. And so things like, when you think about movement, assuming that another planet has organisms that move, and you said a solid surface of a, of a planet, if they're moving along a solid surface, you know, legs are just a really good mechanical solution to the problem of how do you move across the surface and, and, and you know, exert a force without in, incurring too much friction. So, so oftentimes we find the laws of physics constrain what, what's possible. And I can speculate that, that moving alien life will have legs. I mean, there will be some of them with legs. I, I think that's, that's an obvious... That's an obvious answer. Talk about communication. Again, communication is largely constrained by physics. What kind of atmosphere do you have? You have a very sparse atmosphere. Sound isn't a very good way of, of communicating. You have a nice thick atmosphere like Earth. Sound is a fantastic way of communicating. So, so whatever the physical characteristics of, of, of the, the planet are, will certainly constrain the kinds of traits that, that will evolve. And because they are constrained, that means the same ones are going to evolve again and again and again. And if you think about if you think about organisms on Earth, how they communicate, uh, ones that communicate using vision as opposed to using sound, it depends again on the on the transparency of the the the, the, the environment in which they live. Uh, same thing on another planet. If they live in a in a very optically opaque environment. Um, using vision to communicate is not a good solution. Uh, talking about cons constraints, sorry. No problem. <laughs> My favorite part was um, the fact that uh, the autotrophs, like plants, can really never evolve complex thinking or consciousness or civilizations because they are autotrophs. Is that... Ah. When you... So Again, one has to be modest and careful, and, and there could be a set of, of conditions on a particular planet in which things play out a little differently. But the most, the obvious, the most common um, outcome will be that those organisms that are facing 
time critical challenges. So do I go left? Do I go right? Um, someone's coming to eat me. Uh, those are the ones that will evolve complex ways of processing sensory information. There's no point really in a plant having a brain because it doesn't need to make quick decisions. Evolution is very economical. Uh, the, the, you can you can put your energy into into having a brain, growing a brain, or you can put your energy into growing up and getting more sunlight. And 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 a plant's going to choose the going to choose the second one. So, but rather than sort of thinking about it in terms of plants, autotrophs, heterotrophs, um, I think you, we should think about it in terms of of what challenges the organism is facing. So, there's certainly conceivable you could have an autotroph sunlight um, absorbing organism on another planet that for some reason still has to evade predators, in which case perhaps having some kind of, 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 of nervous system would actually uh, be an advantage. But it would probably move then <laughs> because, you know, if you can't move, then then it's not all clear what kind of urgent decisions um, uh, you have to solve. And if you look at the history of, of animals on Earth, you certainly see that all of our sensory systems evolve to tell us about the environment. Where's the food? Where's someone coming to eat me? And things like that. And then the, the, the rest of it, the, all the processing, all the cognition came afterwards. Once you have, first you get a brain because you need one to see, to be able to interpret the visual world. But then once you have a brain, it can be used, it can be adapted to perform other tasks, deciding which way to go. Um, and, and, and intelligence then grows on top of that complex processing apparatus that started with sensory processing. So what about then, uh, you already mentioned uh, brain and intelligence. This is another topic that often it's thought that, okay, if, if we find life somewhere outside Earth, probably it's just some bacteria or something. But then again, after reading your book, it doesn't seem so strange if, if there are <laughs> living beings somewhere, someplace else, could be intelligent too. Because you, in order to have communication or with the communication, you, have so, you need to have some sort of sociality and social skills. And then again, intelligence is uh, like a pretty good thing to have in, in order to survive. Yeah, I mean, all an, all animals have intelligence. Again, that's tied up with this idea that they have to make decisions. They, they they move, so they have to make decisions, left or right, forward or backwards. So all animals have intelligence of some kind. And in general, when you when you try, however you can do it, to compare the intelligence of animals, and it's not an easy task, but you can you can make some efforts at that. You tend to see that it is those social animals that have more complex cognition. They have to uh, understand social relationships, uh, identify individuals, identify, understand what, whether they're on friendly terms with another animal or not. So, so we see this, we, we see a growth in complex cognition alongside a growth in complex sociality. And I think we could expect to see that sort of pattern repeated on other planets as well. What isn't at all clear is how quickly that will happen. I mean, it was 3.8 billion years after life began before humans evolved. And is that a long time? Is that a short time? We really don't know. We really don't know. It could be that on other planets, uh, complex linguistic, intelligent, technological civilizations will arise extremely quickly in a billion years or something. Uh, and it could be that Earth is a, is a fluke and that actually um, other planets could go 10 billion years without any, uh, without any technological beings like humans. We don't know the answer to that one. Well, then with, with intelligence, we have a lot more questions and we have still a couple of, couple of minutes left. So maybe we could take the ethical point of view that you all, all, all also have in the book. Because uh, I, I was really delighted to read the book, because uh, on the one hand, we are very careful about what do we think about 
space aliens or, or aliens someplace else and what's our relationship to the aliens. And then again, we have these other species on Earth too and we either eat them or then, then we don't care about them on, that, on the same level as we kind of care or think about aliens. Is this a special trick in your book that you're bringing the ethics to the game too? Yeah, and, and I'm kind of optimistic about that. I actually think that were we to discover alien life, complex alien life, alien animals essentially, uh, were we to discover that, I think it would rewrite our relationship with animals on Earth. I think that that it would cause a re-examination of what actually does it mean to be intelligent? What does it actually mean to be human? Um, what is the difference? But are we, if we were to dis discover intelligent, um, technological speaking, you know, linguistic aliens on another planet, well, uh, would we have a, a stronger bond to them than we would to animals on earth with whom we're actually quite closely related relative to the aliens. Um, you, you know, these are, these are questions we'd, we'd, we'd have to re-examine. And I think, I like to think that, that we would re-examine them in favor of saying, well, wait, actually life on earth, understanding the, the place of life on earth and where it fits into the evolution of life in the universe makes us a very special place. And, and we do have to give special consideration to, to life on this planet as well. So and then we have to think about the personhood too, and and like it changes our view on ourselves, of course. Yeah, and uh, you know we are alone on this planet, the only species that communicates with a true language, and that makes us very special indeed because we can understand each other's thoughts, we can express our thoughts to other people, and it really creates a, an awful lot of, of the empathy that, that we feel for, for other humans. Um, clearly, if we were to discover a similar, similarly linguistic alien civilization, we would feel some sort of connection, some sort of empathy with them. My question is, if we were to discover that dolphins, for instance, had a language, will we feel the same empathy for them? Um, these are these are not easy questions. These, I mean, there, there is a lot of philosophy here and a lot of psychology too. Um, but but I think I'd like to think that that we can we can use this as a tool to to re-examine re-examine why we think what we think about both about animals on Earth and about any life we would find on another planet. What about if the first contact isn't is just a message? Like this is a possibility that you don't deal that much on your book, but like yeah. as well, you're you're researching the communication between between animals. So what about this? Yeah, option? And, and I do I do also work on on questions of how we would communicate, um, how we would translate, interpret craft our own message in, in cases like like that. I think far more likely is that we will discover um, uh, chemical signals of, of, of life on other planets before we discover um, intelligent and technological civilizations. But, you know, the other thing is that's less of a problem. If we get in touch with, with an alien civilization by radio message, and we manage to decode the message and communicate. And I'm just going to say to them, could you please send me your David Attenborough documentaries? And then I know everything about, about life on their planet, right? So look, that would actually be okay. I'm not too worried about that. Yeah, I'm thinking the difficult part is, is the decoding. If, if we don't is, have anything is. in common with them, yeah. Yeah, or yeah. If, we have, if the only common thing is the natural selection, then it's difficult, yeah. Well, you know, we've we've uh, one of the projects that I'm involved in uh, with a group called the Interstellar Foundation is is thinking about how you craft a, a a message that would be understood by any intelligent technological civilization anywhere um, in in the in the galaxy. And uh, we've actually got a video competition running at the moment. Uh, if you Google Interstellar Foundation, um, that uh, that invites people to to design a video message that you think would be universally understandable and one of the elements that i think needs to appear in that message is the process of evolution 
of life on Earth because any alien scientist seeing some sort of graphical uh, animation of the progression of life on Earth through time would understand what that means. They'd understand that immediately. Just as any alien astronomer seeing an a, a, um, a animation of the formation of the solar system would instantly say, OK, I, I see what's going on here. I understand what's going on here. So I think that that's a very powerful way to, to, to communicate, um, even if we don't share a language. Uh, do you think they might also come in help for, with the technology to save the planet, like stop the climatic change and stuff? Is there is hope for that? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are scared of making contact with alien civilizations in case they come and eat us. Um, but I do, so to come back to the, the, the point we opened with, I do think there is a danger in any technological civilization um, that we will cause so much damage that we will not survive. And any civilization that does survive presumably found a way to overcome the kinds of problems that, that, that we're going through at the moment, sort of rapid advance in technology without a corresponding uh, rapid uh, advance in how we, how we protect our, our, our ecosystem. So I would hope that any alien civilization that is more advanced than us has some of these answers um, that they've that they've got over their tendency for exploitation of resources they've got over their tendency for war and 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 so on um, i'm not very optimistic we will find them but if we were to find them i'm optimistic that they won't eat us and they might even provide some answers okay that this might this could be a good good point to end our discussion and theme to contemplate while walking home, for example. For example, so thank you very much, Arik. Thank you, Suvi. Thank you both. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. Nice talking to you, and uh, see you again. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully. Bye bye. 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 Ja, siinä ei ollut mitään säännöitä. Millaisesti ratkaisi edes? Joo.